Okay, I'm excited to be here once again. You guys are stuck with me tonight. And uh, for that, I apologize, but not really. I'm just kidding. No, it's a blessing to be here. I'm, I'm happy to, to be able to be here, uh, especially tonight, uh, again, with, with Holdfast Baptist Church. You guys got a great church here. And let me just give you one word of advice before I leave, okay? And this is nothing has nothing to do with the sermon, <clears throat> but if there's one thing I can leave you with, other than what I'm going to preach tonight, is this. Do not take this church for granted. Do not take this church for granted. It's easy, you know, in the day and age in which we live to just kind of expect that we have the things that we have and, you know, the blessings that God has given to us. But, you know, all of it can easily be taken away from us at a moment's notice. And so make sure you thank your pastor. Make sure you show him gratitude. Make sure you thank God that you have a local New Testament church. There's a lot of people out there in this world that would give their right arm to be where you're at today. And so make sure you thank God for that and, and never take this church for granted. Never take the preaching of God's word for granted. Never take the fact that you have a local New Testament church that not only preaches the gospel week in and week out, but also, you know, preaches the word of God and, and is constantly helping you to mature in the Lord. Never take that for granted. Now, with that being said, I want to thank Pastor Brzezarski once again for the invitation. Thank his family. And uh, thank you, Brother Garrett, for uh, giving me a ride to and from uh, church. He, he wears a lot of hats in this church, I noticed. He does the media. He sings the songs. He also reads uh, the scriptures. And apparently he's a cook, too. He's going to be grilling the burgers. Is that correct? I don't know if you're. I don't know if he does all those things like greatly. I mean, it's, you know, with 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 you know, 100% accuracy. But yeah, at least he does them. So I guess we'll see how you make those burgers tonight. Uh, but uh, you got yourself a profitable servant right there. He's doing a great job, and of course, uh, your daughter does a great job on the piano. And um, I really thank God for this church. So let's get right into the sermon tonight. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number three. It says here, "Let no man deceive you by any means." For that day shall not come except to come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the title of my sermon this evening is Reasons Why We're Not in the Tribulation. Reasons Why We Are Not in the Tribulation. Now, you see, that seems kind of silly to even have to preach something like this. And honestly, you know, as I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking, why am I preaching this sermon? Isn't this kind of like something that we already know in churches? But you know what? We're living in a world that's so crazy and so filled with so much misinformation and so much deceit and so much fear mongering is taking place in our nation today that a lot of Christians have just bit into a lot of lies, bit into a lot of heresy. And they're allowing the fear mongers of this world to cause them to think that, believe it or not, we're in the tribulation right now. And, you know, the mark of the beast is being rolled down and the Antichrist is already here in power and all these things. But I'm here to tell you that we're not there yet. Now, let me just go, by way of introduction, let me say a couple things first. First and foremost, we obviously understand that. You know, we as pastors and as churches, as Christians, especially in the new IFP, we spent a lot of time trying to convince Christians that the rapture isn't imminent, right? I mean, we fought that battle for years, you know, against even our independent fundamental Baptist brethren, trying to teach people, hey, you know, the time of the day of Christ is not in hand. Jesus Christ is not going to come at any moment, not even at the end of this service. You know, you hear a lot of pastors say, you know, he could come in any moment, even at the end of the service. And, and you know, he's not going to come tomorrow. He's not going to come next week. He's not going to even come at the end of this year. You know, if anything, he might come at the end of three years, three and a half years. But for sure, it's not nowhere, anywhere near close as in tomorrow, today, next week. And in fact, in this very chapter, it says in verse number one, the Apostle Paul writing here, of course, we know that he is inspired by God to write these words. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. It's a word that we use to describe a biblical doctrine known as the gathering together. It's God. It's when Jesus Christ comes and he gathers together his elect 
to come to heaven. And this is what he's talking about here. He says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the, our gathering together unto him, he says in verse number two, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. Now, what does it mean to be shaken in mind? Well, a modern way of saying this would be kind of anxious, afraid, you know, kind of worried, shaken in mind, meaning like what's going to happen. He says, don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. Listen to this, nor by letter from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying, look, if you get a letter from someone saying that they're the Apostle Paul and they're telling you that the rapture is going to happen at any moment, that Jesus Christ is coming is at hand. He says, don't listen to them because of the fact that, you know, that's not me. That's not what's going to happen. And he goes on to say, let no man deceive you by any means, by letter, by sermon, by word, by spirit. He says, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and a man of sin be revealed. So we've spent a lot of time trying to teach independent fundamental Baptists. We've spent a lot of time teaching other Christians of other denominations that the second coming of Christ, known as the rapture, is not going to happen tomorrow. There's actually a couple events that have to take place prior to him coming, right? And this is very important because, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture is a doctrine that has infiltrated churches for many years through the false teaching of dispensationalism, through the teaching of John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield, and even in Baptist circles, uh, a man by the name of Peter Ruckman has embedded this false doctrine that Jesus Christ can just come at any moment, okay? And the problem with this is that the Bible actually teaches us that the Antichrist can come at any moment. You see, the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ isn't imminent. It's the coming of the Antichrist that is imminent. He can come at any moment. He can be born at any moment. He can be in this world at any moment. And if people are constantly teaching others, hey, Jesus is going to show up at any moment, but then the Antichrist shows up, who do you think modern Christians are going to accept as the Savior? The Antichrist, not Jesus Christ, right? And we spend time explaining that to people. We go to Matthew chapter 24 where the Bible tells us in verse 29 that immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And we explain to them that it's at that point that he shall send forth his angels to gather together his elect. We say that's the rapture, you know, and it comes after the tribulation. In other words, there's all these events, all these cataclysmic global events that are going to take place before Jesus returns and raptures all believers to be with him uh, for all of eternity. And, you know, we fought that battle. We're constantly telling people it's not pre-trib. It's a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. And, you know what, thank God that a lot of people have been reached through that doctrine. You know, and thank God for that doctrine. Thank God for what the Bible teaches about it because it's opened a lot of Christians to the idea of being able to study the book of Revelation themselves. You know, the pre-trib rapture dispensationalism has discouraged a lot of believers from ever going to the book of Revelation. They're like, oh man, it's too complicated. I can't understand it. There's so much uh, symbolism. There's so much craziness in that book. I can't really understand it. Especially if you have the pre-trib rapture in your mind, you can't fit it into the book of Revelation because it doesn't exist. Whereas if you know what the Bible says and how it teaches a post-trib pre-wrath rapture, that Jesus Christ comes after the tribulation, when you read the book of Revelation, it's like, oh, it all makes sense now. I'm not afraid to read this book. It makes perfect sense. This is what the Bible says. And we have constantly fought that battle. And, you know, it got to a point, even in fundamental Baptist churches, where individuals were just not allowed in their congregation if they believe this doctrine. You know, if they believe that Jesus Christ came after the tribulation, it was a point of contention with a lot of pastors. I mean, people were getting kicked out of churches. They were being removed. They were being ostracized and black, uh, blackballed and, and just, you know, deemed as heretics for believing that Jesus Christ came after the tribulation, even though the Bible clearly says that he does, right? And it's not just one passage. We know that it's in Matthew 24. You find that in Mark 13, Luke 21, Revelation 6, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and all these passages they line up and show us that there's a lot of stuff that's going to take place prior to the rapture, prior to when Jesus Christ comes and gathers together his elect. So that's a battle that we fought. But here's the thing, though, is that now it seems as though we have to warn people from swinging too extreme in the other direction, right? 
We've been telling people, hey, the second coming of Christ, the rapture is not at hand. He's not going to come tomorrow. There's a couple things that have to take place prior to that. But now people have swung so far into the other, uh, uh, to the opposite side of that, that now they're just like, oh, we're in the tribulation right now. We're experiencing the events of the end times right now. And you say, you know, where? Well, I'm sure that's not being said in a local New Testament church such as this one right here, because you have a pastor who preaches sound doctrine, and, you know, he knows what the Bible says, he teaches you what the Word of God says, but, you know, there's people out there in Christianity, maybe even sometimes even in fundamental Baptist churches, that they watch every YouTube video that exists on the subject, they listen to every conspiracy theorist, they listen to every single guy out there that has an opinion on the Bible, and they're constantly listening to these people who are teaching this false doctrine that we are currently in the tribulation. But honestly, what it is is just fear-mongering, okay? I mean, people literally think that we are currently experiencing the tribulation. I've heard said that the coronavirus is proof that we're in the tribulation. You know, this pandemic is the fourth seal because all these people are dying. And, you know, the coronavirus is, you know, the Bible talks about famines and pestilences and death on a massive scale. And this is the mark of the tribulation. I had someone come to me and say, you know, hey, Pastor Mejia, you know, coronavirus, corona means crown. A crown is given unto him. He's going forth conquering into conquer. He has a crown, coronavirus. And it's just like, what in the world are you talking about? The vaccine is the mark of the beast. How many of you have ever heard something like that before? Raise your hand if you've heard that. The vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine is the mark of the beast. I mean, I've heard that so many times. And I've been attacked on social media, on YouTube, and different platforms because I don't agree with that. And people will say, how can you say, you're a heretic. How can you say that the vaccine is not? It's like, if you don't believe the vaccine is the mark of the beast, then you're pro-vaccine or something. You know, this false left-right paradigm, if you're not Democrat, you must be a Republican. If you're not Republican, you're a Democrat. Well, it's like, if you don't believe the vaccine is the mark of the beast, then you must be pro-vaccine or something. But folks, I'm neither, okay? And I think you could be against the vaccine and still not believe that it's the mark of the beast. You know, a, a new thing that I've heard is Emmanuel Macron, the French president, being the Antichrist. I mean, I've literally heard this multiple times. And I don't even really care what goes on in France. I mean, do you? <laughs> you know, I, I just don't really see the Antichrist coming from France. You know what I mean? France just doesn't really seem like that kind of place where the Antichrist would come from. But, you know, there's people that say Emmanuel Macron must be the Antichrist because Emmanuel means, you know, the Bible, God with us. And Macron means like Mark, you know, like Mark of the Beast, God with us, Mark of the Beast. It's him! And I'm telling you, people are like, hey, you think this guy is like, you know, the Antichrist? And I'm like, no. He's like, why? Well, number one, he's not a Jew. And the Bible seems to indicate that the Antichrist will be a Jew, okay? But number two, you know, just, you know, Macron, you know, might mean Mark, but, you know, that's the French language. It doesn't necessarily mean that he is the Antichrist, okay? You know, you have people where every time there's a blood moon, they're like, oh, it's, it's the end. <laughs> it's like there's a blood moon. It's the end. And you see on social media and Instagram and all these. Other, it's like the blood moon. It's about to happen. You have these Pentecostal charismatic types. They see a blood moon. It's just like the end is near. Because the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall be turned into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord. But then what happens the day after the blood moon? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. People go to work. They just live their normal lives. And they don't realize that there's always blood moons all the time, okay? Here's a new one that I heard is, and this is one that was brought to my attention, and I, I just literally saw it this morning on social media, is that the river Euphrates has been dried up. And they're like, oh, we are so near the end. The end is here. The river Euphrates has been dried up. Now, what they're referring to is that in Revelation, uh, I believe it's chapter 14, the Bible talks about the river Euphrates being dried up to make way for the kings of the north, okay? And it, it's, it's a statement that you see in the Bible, in the book of Revelation specifically. But what that's referring to is the river Euphrates being dried up 
after the seven years that the Bible highlights, when Jesus Christ comes the third time to fight against the Antichrist and set up his millennial reign. So when he's about to fight against the Antichrist, the river Euphrates is dried up, the kings of the north come, and then you have the battle of Armageddon, what we see in Revelation chapter 19. So here's the problem. If the river Euphrates is dried up right now, we have a huge problem because that actually takes place at the end of the seven years, before Jesus Christ sets up his millennial reign. But here's the thing, is that people, they hear that on social media, they hear that on the news, they hear that on the History Channel or whatever, they see it on the Discovery Channel, they, the Great River Euphrates is being dried up, and they don't bother to actually go to the Bible to see if that's true, if it even matches up with what the Bible says. They just take it at face value, it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're dead, tomorrow's the day, we're all gonna, you know, the Antichrist is here, but then nothing happens, and I feel like going to every one of those people and saying, what now? <laughs> What now? Nothing happened. You know, just because the river Euphrates is drying up doesn't mean anything because it might rain for 40 days and 40 nights and then the river Euphrates will be filled with water again. People literally told me, I remember them saying in 2020, this is the beginning of the tribulation. And I told them, I was like, you know, it's pretty bad in this world, but I don't think this is the tribulation. And they're like, no, for sure. 2020, this is the tribulation. Okay. All this craziness going on with coronavirus and then the vaccine. You know, this is the beginning of sorrows. But, you know, here we are in 2022. And we haven't really seen everything that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 have talked about. And as far as I know, it looks like even Joe Biden himself has said that, Coronavirus is not even a thing anymore. He's kind of like, yeah, the pandemic's over. You know, everything's going to go back to normal. I mean, even Canada, Pastor Rosarski, I think it was you that told me, Canada's going back to normal. I mean, when you, when you see Canada going back to normal, that's how you know it's nowhere near the tribulation as of yet. And they said, you know, 2020, I had someone tell me, yeah, and three, because, you know, if we're in the tribulation in 2020, that would mean 2023 is essentially the end of those three, because the tribulation last for three and a half years okay it lasts for three and a half years and then the last 75 days of those three and a half years is what's called great tribulation which is when jesus christ comes but you know we're here in church today in 2022 listening to preaching no one is kicking down the doors trying to force you to take uh the mark of the beast they're trying to slay you for being a christian it's not happening but what is that you know i'll tell you what it is it's people out there who are seeking to fear monger and, and, and teach this crazy nonsense that we are supposedly in the tribulation. Now, let me just say this is that I do believe we're living in the last days, okay? You know, even the Bible says, go with me if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we're obviously living in the last days. We're living in the end times. And the reason I say that is because the Bible 2,000 years ago, called those days the end times. It called those days the last days, okay? And in fact, let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1. It says, God who had sundry times, sundry times in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he hath made the world. So according to the Bible, when Jesus Christ physically walked on this earth, the Bible refers to that as the last days. He goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, referring to Jesus. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, did you hear that? It says that when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, the Bible refers to that as the end of the world. Now, why would it do that? Well, because of the fact that to God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And when you think about it, during Jesus' time, that was essentially the beginning of the end, right? That's the beginning of the end. So if the Bible refers to Jesus' day when he was here and when he was crucified as being the end of the world, how much closer are we to the end of the world today, 2,000 years later, right? And in fact, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. It says here, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, 
Now, let me ask you a question. Are we living in those days today? I mean, when you go on social media, I mean, just the term selfie, right? And how many people take selfies and post selfies? And there's just what? Lovers of their own selves. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I mean, would you say that describes in the day and age in which we live today? Of course. People fit this description like a glove. It says in verse 3, without natural affection, truce breakers. You know, there was a time, you know, even 50 years ago where your word meant something. You know, you say you're going to do it, and that's all you needed was that person's word. But now people's word doesn't mean anything at all. They're truce breakers. False accusers, incontinent, fierce. Listen to this. Despisers of those that are good. I mean, if that doesn't describe 2022, I don't know what does. Where people just hate others for just being good people. You can have innocent individuals walking down the street and then other individuals will come and just beat them up and just try to murder them and kill them just for being innocent bystanders. They hate Christians. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, mind you, this is referring to what? The last days. So if we're living in 2022 and we can look around in the world around us and see that our world fits this description, that would mean that we're in the last days. And, you know, the Bible talks about that in the last days, it shall be like the days of Lot, right? Where all the sodomy was taking place. Of course, Sodom and Gomorrah was a place where all this filth and perversion, was, all these abominable acts were taking place. And it was such a wicked and vile city that God had to rain down fire. and God had to intervene himself, literally, and rain down fire and brimstone upon a city because they're so wicked and vile and corrupt. Right? And the Bible says that the end of days, it will be like that. Well, you know, what? we're kind of living in those days. Now, it's not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. But it's pretty bad, right? Now, I'll be honest with you, Pastor uh, Pazarnsky and I were just talking about California, how much we love California, and how California is just the best state in the world. I mean, I don't even know how other people can live in other states when you have California, amen? And, you know, people are often mock California and say, oh, man, there's so many homos in California. There's so many sodomites in California. But, you know, he just told me that he's gone so many multiple times and not even running or seen a homo. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, I live in Anaheim, California, and obviously, you know, our church got bombed in Los Angeles, but that's a different story. But, you know, even there, when we're in Anaheim, we're knocking on doors, we don't even see sodomites there. I mean, we went through Gay Pride Month in the month of June, and I went to a Starbucks to go get a coffee, and Starbucks is some of the most homo-friendly organizations out there. They didn't even have a rainbow flag up when I was there. You know, but here's the thing. The same can't be said of every single state in the United States. There's a lot of sodomy in this country, okay? A lot of perversion, a lot of filth. And so that shows us that, yeah, we are kind of living in the last days. We're nearing this period, this time, where Jesus is going to come back, where it's going to culminate to the great tribulation. It's going to culminate to the beginning of sorrows. It's going to culminate and come to a head where these events are actually going to take place. Now, let me just say this is it. Why would people lie about being in the tribulation or about us being in tribulation in the end times? Why would people do that? You know, are they misinformed? Maybe they just don't know the Bible. Like, why would they do those things? Why would they make those videos and tell people, hey, the vaccine is the mark of the beast. Hey, we're in the tribulation. Why would people do that? Well, number one is that they do it for attention. Okay? You know, the Bible tells us that some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. There's literally people out there who, if they know a video will get them a million views, doesn't matter what it is or if it's accurate, they'll put it out there. They will make a video to get a million views, even if it's biblically inaccurate, only because they want the attention. Okay. And a prime example of this is a guy by the name of Robert Breaker. He has predicted the, the, the rapture so many times, like every single year. And of course, every single year he's wrong. But he doesn't mind putting that out there because he wants the attention. You understand? But, you know, that's wicked. We shouldn't desire that. We shouldn't want to put information out there that's not accurate, that is not biblically sound just to get attention. We want to put out there, we want to put the truth out there. 
We want to preach the Word of God with accuracy. We want to preach the Word of God as it is in God's Word, regardless of how many views it gets, regardless of who listens to it or not. You know, but there's people out there who do it for attention. But here's another reason why people have put out this misinformation about us being in the tribulation, is that sometimes people actually relish in corrupting God's Word. Believe it or not, there are wicked people out there who actually don't mind lying about the Bible. Now, that might come as a surprise to you because you're thinking like, how can people be this way? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. And so the Apostle Paul said that there are many out there in this world who willingly want to corrupt God's Word and lie about the Bible and claim that these things are true. But here's the main reason why I think people teach this stuff. And that's, because, and that's to subvert people from God's Word and prepare them for the Antichrist. That's why I think that. You say, wait, people are teaching us that we're in the tribulation right now, that the mark of the beast is here now, that the Antichrist is reigning now, that all these things are taking place now to prepare us for the Antichrist and to subvert people from the Word of God. That doesn't make sense. Well, think about this. You know, if they're constantly saying we're in the tribulation, if they're constantly saying, this is the mark of the beast, if they're constantly saying, hey, Emmanuel, this guy, Emmanuel from France, he's the Antichrist, if they're constantly bringing up nonsense like that, but nothing ever comes about it, what is it going to do? It's going to cause people to lose faith in the Bible. It's going to cause people to say, these Christians are dumb. These Christians, are, these people are nuts. They're constantly saying that we're in the tribulation. They're constantly saying that the end of the world is next week. They're constantly saying that the vaccine is the mark of the beast and that the Antichrist is here. After a while, that, can, that song can only be sung so many times before normal human beings are just going to be like, you know what? That's why I don't read the Bible. That's why I hate the Word of God. That's why Christians are hypocrites. That's why I don't want to become a Christian. I don't want to go to church because they're always espousing these nonsensical ideas and conspiracy theories that never come to flourishion. Now look, folks, when we look at God's Word, we know that the tribulation is a legitimate thing. The Antichrist is a legitimate person as far as he's real. We know that the mark of the beast will be a legitimate thing that is instituted. But here's the thing is that if you're having all these false flags come up, you know, the boy who cried wolf, always going out and saying that this is what's happening, this is what's going on, people are going to lose faith in Christians. They're going to lose faith in the Word of God. And what's the result of that? The result of it is when it actually happens, they're not going to believe it's end time stuff. They're not going to believe the Bible still. When the tribulation is actually here and the Antichrist actually reveals himself, they're going to think, oh, he's just a political savior. He's here to help us. You Christians have been wrong about tribulation and all this nonsense. We're not going to believe you because you've been saying that for years on end, and it never happens. And in fact, go with me, if you would, to go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. While you're turning, I'm going to read to you from Titus chapter 1, verse number 9. It says, Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for the filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Look at 2 Peter 3. In verse number three, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers. Now, what is a scoffer? Well, another way, a good way to remember what scoffer means is it rhymes with mocker. And a mocker is someone who makes fun of something, right? And in context, it's saying that in the last days, there's going to be people who make fun of the Bible, okay? Walking after their own lust. Listen to what it says in verse four and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So there's going to be people who are saying, you've been saying Jesus is going to come back for how long? And he's still not here. Everything continues as it was from the beginning of creation. They're going to mock and scoff at the word of God 
because of it. And it's because of people like this who just go too far on the left of the pendulum. They swing so far to the opposite side that now they're just like, we are in the tribulation. This is the mark of the beast. You know, this is what's going on here. Now, let me just say this is that I'm not saying the tribulation can't happen next week, next year or something like that. Because obviously it quite possibly could. Okay. I'm not saying that this stuff can happen within our lifetime because I personally believe it probably will. It might not, but it probably will. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that at this exact moment, we are not experiencing those things right now. Okay. He said, well, how do you know? Well, I'm going to give you a couple reasons tonight uh, as to why we're not in the tribulation. And I'll be as quick as I possibly can because burgers await. I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, Garrett's, you know, he's going to cook some burgers. I'm, I'm kind of curious to know how skills are like. I'm just joking. But I'm going to give you some reasons why we are currently not in the tribulation today. Now, it's going to take you some, some discipline to actually listen a little bit here because I'm going to give you a lot of deep doctrine. And we're going to go to the book of Revelation and we're going to study this out. But I'm telling you, this is beneficial. It'll help you. And it'll help you to answer a lot of these people because you're going to get people at the door. You're going to have people who are going to come to you and say, hey, did you know, you know, Emmanuel Macron, he's the real antichrist. And you don't want to be carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You don't want to just give in to every conspiracy theorist that's out there and just believe every single thing that people tell you. You don't want to be simple. You know, the Bible says that the simple passed on and are punished. It's important that we learn God's word and we know what the Bible says about these things. So go, to, go with me if you would to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter number 6. I'm going to give you some basic things here. Probably some things you've already heard. Probably some things you've already learned. But for me to write the same things unto you is not grievous, but for you it is safe. That's what the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. Number one as to why we're not in the tribulation. The events of the tribulation happen on a global scale, okay? So what do you mean by that? Well, you know, a lot of times these people who say we're in the tribulation, they're referring to some isolated incident in like China or something where it doesn't affect us at all. It doesn't affect anybody at all other than that particular pocket of the world, you understand? Whereas what we see in the tribulation or what the Bible refers to as the beginning of sorrows is actually something that takes place globally, worldwide it affects everyone okay now you're in revelation 6 i'm going to read to you from matthew 24 real quick to give us some context here he says in verse number four of matthew 24 jesus answered and said to them take heed that no man deceive you now that comes up quite often when he's talking about the end times which should kind of help us to realize oh there's probably gonna be a lot of deception going on in the end times right he says take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And that's what it says. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So those three years that we see in the Bible, and specifically what we're going to look at in Revelation, is actually referred to as the beginning of sorrows. Now, why is it called the beginning of sorrows? It's called the beginning of sorrows because it's something that actually affects not just Christians, it affects unbelievers as well. So everyone in this world is thrown into this period of time known as the beginning of sorrows. It's not until the very end of that period of time that it becomes great tribulation, not for unbelievers, but for believers. Because it's at that time that Christians are killed for their faith, they're persecuted, etc. Whereas the beginning of sorrows is referring to that inception of tribulation for the entire world. Okay, That means everyone is being affected by this. Now look at Revelation 6 and verse number 1. It says here, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now this is referring to the Antichrist. And the reason we know it's the Antichrist is because he's trying to mimic and copy the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because when you read Revelation 19, Jesus Christ, when he's coming to set up his earthly kingdom, also comes on a white horse. He's coming to conquer. He's going forth conquering to conquer in Revelation 19. That's when he sets up his millennial reign. And that's when we just, it's vacation for a thousand years for us. It's like, we ain't got to worry about taxes or people breaking into our houses or stealing things or bums rot walking in to your church building. We don't worry about any of that. It's a, it's a time of perfect peace, okay? And so, but hold on a second. Seven years prior to that, the Antichrist comes on a white horse. And guess what? He's also coming to set up his own little kingdom. So this is why we know the Antichrist, a lot of people are going to think he is Jesus Christ because he could easily point to the Bible and say, oh no, I'm coming to set up my millennial reign and people are going to think it's Jesus Christ, but it's actually the Antichrist who's coming on the scene. He says in verse number two, and I, be, uh, I, and I saw and behold a white horse. No, let's skip down to verse three, excuse me. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So this is referring to wars and rumors of wars. Now, here's the thing is that there's always wars going on. I mean, you have what's called the military industrial complex. And that machine can't stop. It can't. It needs to keep going. And in order for it, need to, for, for it to keep going, people are constantly feeding into it. You know, they got to constantly create wars, right? So there's always wars taking place. There's always wars and rumors of wars. So this could potentially refer to maybe even World War III, some global war that's taking place here. It says in verse number five, and when he had opened the third sea, I heard the third beast say, come and see, and I beheld the low a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now what is this referring to? It's referring to famine. Now, let me just take a break here and let you know that these aren't literal horses, okay? You know, this is obviously symbolically representing specific events that are taking place in the end times. And this black horse is pictures, it pictures famine, it pictures that there's a lack of food and inflation, major inflation to the point where people are starving. You say, well, hold on a second, you said inflation. Didn't we just experience inflation now? Yeah, but you know what? No one's starving though. And in fact, we're going to have burgers after the service. Right, Garrett? I'm just kidding. You know, we're eating right after. I mean, I'm putting a lot of pressure on Garrett now, you know, to do this, to make, make it happen. I'm just joking. But, you know, we, I'm sure all of us have eaten throughout this week. None of us has starved. None of us have gone without. Well, this is referring to a lot of people starving during this time. Famine means there's a lack of food. Okay. He says in verse number uh, eight, and I look and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. So it culminates to this pale horse that essentially just represents death. And I think the reason it says that hell's following with him is because it's, it's essentially saying that the vast majority of people who are dying during this time are going to hell. They're not saved. They haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there, there, there be that go in thereat, you understand? And so this pale horse represents death, it represents pestilence, it rep it's a culmination of the wars and the famines and the death that comes because of the pestilences. This is not referring to coronavirus, okay? So th this is what's known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now these four horsemen don't only affect Christians, it affects everyone. Because here we see that him that sat on him was called death and hell followed with him. So obviously I'm referring to Christians because Christians don't go to hell. You understand? We have eternal life. The Bible says that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we're saved eternally. It teaches us that we have everlasting life, that we can never lose our salvation. This is obviously referring to unbelievers. Now go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, if you would. Revelation chapter 12. Now, if there's one chapter in the book of Revelation that's probably one of the most cryptic chapters in this particular book, it's chapter 12, okay? A lot of symbology, a lot of just different pictures that you see on there, and it can confuse you if you don't necessarily know the timeline of what's taking place in the end times. But here in Revelation 12, John sees this vision, 
And what this vision represents is what's going to take place in the end times, what, this, what we know as the beginning of sorrows. He says in verse number one, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars from heaven, of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, when you read that, you think to yourself, okay, this woman sounds like it could be referring to Mary, because she gave birth to Jesus Christ. But look what it says in verse number... Six, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, Mary didn't physically do that. And so it would reason that this is actually referring to Eve. Okay, This is describing Eve because Eve, as the Bible calls her, is the mother of all living. You understand? And it's through Eve that we're here, but it's also through Eve that Jesus Christ was born as well. You know, Mary came through Eve. Mary bore Jesus Christ. And so it would, we can see that this could be referring to Eve because it says that the woman goes into the wilderness and it gives us an amount of time that she stays in the wilderness. It says she's there for 1,203 score days. That's referring to 1,200 days and 60 days okay now obviously it's not referring to literal eve because eve died a really long time ago okay this is re representing all of mankind and the reason we know that it's rep representing all of mankind during this time is because of the fact that the woman is in the wilderness which represents tribulation in the bible the woman is in that wilderness for a thousand two hundred and sixty days well, it just so happens that the beginning of sorrows, the four horsemen that we just looked at, that period of time lasts for 1,260 days. And in fact, 75 days after the 1,260 days, you have great tribulation. And at the end of those 75 days, you have the rapture taking place. I don't want to bore you with all this information, but let me just let you know right now that in Daniel chapter 12, the Lord tells Daniel, blessed is he that cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. In other words, he's saying, whoever makes it to the last of those thousand three hundred and thirty five days shall be blessed. Now, why did he say that? He's saying that because at the end of those days is when Jesus Christ returns. So if someone is able to survive the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the great tribulation, and they're able to make it to the 1,335th day, then they experience the rapture. They see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. Now, how wonderful would that be, right? To be able to suffer all that persecution and tribulation, and then you're there and you actually see Jesus Christ with your own eyes coming in the clouds, and then, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's going to be a crazy sight. You know, all these bodies coming up out of the grave of saved believers from you know, thousands of years. I mean, you might just die looking at that, just out of a heart attack probably. But if you even survive that side, then you start floating off the ground and you, you get raptured yourself because the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them together in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he says that whoever makes it to the 1,335th day is blessed. Well, if you have 1,260 days... You have 75 days missing there. That means 75, it's 75 days of persecution and great tribulation. This is how we know that the 1,260 days is something that the entire world experiences. So because Eve is referred to as the mother of all living, we know that essentially the entire world goes into this chaotic state known as the beginning of sorrows where they experience wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, death on a massive scale. You understand? He said, what's the point you're trying to make? Because you already lost me with all those numbers and thousand this and one thousand this and one thousand that. What I'm trying to say is this, is that none of that has happened yet. <laughs> I mean, we're here right now listening to preaching, 
We're waiting on those burgers in just a bit. We haven't experienced wars and rumors of wars. We have not experienced famine on a massive scale where a measure of wheat is for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. There hasn't been pestilences. We've had coronavirus, but you know what? That's came and gone. And if the coronavirus was the four horsemen of the apocalypse, guess what? The fifth seal, we would have already been in it. And if we're in the fifth seal, then we're in trouble because the fifth seal is when we, you and I die. <laughs> it's when they start killing Christians for our faith. You understand? So this is how we know that we are not in the tribulation at this moment. Don't let people come to you and say, hey, we're in the fourth seal. Hey, we're in the third seal. Hey, we're in the first seal. Hey, we're in the second seal. Hey, you know, most of the time they get their stuff all mixed up. They don't even know what they're talking about. And you know what they're doing? They're hoping, listen to this, they hope that you have no idea what the Bible truly says. They hope that you'll just take their word for it and just believe them and just hit the, hit the like button and write a comment, praise the Lord, brother. I'll be praying for us during this tribulation and that you hit the subscribe button, you follow them, and they hope that you never crack open this book to actually see the truth for yourself. But folks, we just saw all this crazy stuff that's going to happen during the tribulation where all of the entire world is dying. I mean, people are suffering majorly. And look, wouldn't you agree that there's a lot of people suffering today? Absolutely. But you know what? Not on a global scale. There's plenty of people in the United States of America that have it pretty good. I mean, we're, I don't know of any churches on Sunday morning who have suffered persecution going out soul winning and are being put to death. Have you? And I remember I got, someone contacted me on social media and they told me, you're a heretic, you are a false prophet because we are in the tribulation. I said, where are Christians dying? He said, in China. I'm like, well, you know, I feel bad for those Christians, but, you know, it's not a global thing, though. And according to the Bible, it's global. So if the tribulation is not global yet, then, yeah, you might be suffering through Tribulation, like anybody suffers tribulation, but it's not the tribulation, okay? Go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Reasons we're not in the tribulation. Number one, the events of the tribulation happen on a global scale, and it's not taking place right now. Now, again, let me just give you this disclaimer that this sermon can be taken down within the next year or so if, if it does happen. It's just like, well, this isn't relevant anymore. <laughs> like, this did not age well or whatever and take it down because we're in the tribulation. I'm saying at this particular moment right now, okay? Number two, number two reason why we're not in the tribulation, listen to this, the abomination of desolation has not been set up, okay? This is how we know we are not in the tribulation. Now, God is so wonderful that he will give us a phrase that we can easily remember by causing the words to rhyme. Abomination of desolation. I mean, that's a pretty easy phrase to remember. And I think it's one of the reasons why is because it's such an important event in end times prophecy. And in fact, you know, when people tell me like, how do you know when the tribulation is? When do you know for sure that we're in the tribulation? And I tell them this, the smoking gun of the tribulation is the abomination of desolation. Okay, what is that? Well, let me explain a couple things before we get into Revelation 13, okay? First and foremost, we saw that the Antichrist comes on the scene in the very beginning. But here's the thing is that we don't really know it's him as of yet. Because it doesn't really tell us that he kind of reveals himself as of yet. So he's kind of working in the, in, 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 in the uh, you know, back of the, in, in the scenes. He's working in the darkness. People don't really know who he is as of yet, okay? And the Bible would imply that he's potentially ruling with like a coalition of kings. There's like a, like a, like a board of kings that are actually ruling at the same time. So when you look at, if you were to look at 10 kings and you were to say one of these guys is the Antichrist, you wouldn't be able to tell who it is because there's 10 of them. Unless, of course, one of them dies and comes back to life, which is exactly what happens to the Antichrist. Okay, Look at verse number 1 of Revelation 13. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. This is John speaking here. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. 
and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This is obviously a satanic organization, right? This is what the Bible, this is what we would refer to as the New World Order. So this beast represents this New World Order that's going to be run by the Antichrist himself. Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, referring to Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So this is referring to a man who is essentially being helped and supported by Satan himself. Satan is giving him, you know, authority. He's giving him power. He's giving him his position of power in the government. It says in verse number three, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So this is saying that this particular person actually receives a wound to the head. He dies, because a deadly wound is a wound that makes you dead, right? <laughs> a deadly wound to the head, he dies, but then it says that his deadly wound is healed. And then all the world wonders after the beast. Why are they wondering? Because they're like, wow, this guy came back to life. This guy died, some sniper took him out or something. We don't know exactly how, but he dies and he comes back to life. You say, why is that important? Well, think about this. If the Antichrist is trying to uh, mimic Jesus Christ, he's going to try to do exactly what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He died. Three days later, what did he do? He resurrected from the grave, right? And when people saw the resurrected Christ, many believed on him. They knew that he was the Christ. You know, Thomas, he said, you know, unless I touch his, his, uh, his wounds and his hands and on his side, I will not believe. And then, you know, Jesus came and said, be not faithless, but believe in. And he touched his side and he believed. Well, you know, the Antichrist, who's someone who's coming in the place of Christ, is going to seek to do the same thing. He's going to receive a deadly wound to the head. He's going to die. And you know what? I would speculate that he probably, he's probably going to be dead for what? Three days, just to, mimic the, just to mimic Jesus Christ. And on the third day, the Bible says that Satan possesses his body and he comes back to life, at which point the world will wonder after the beast. Okay? He says in verse number four, and they worship the dragon, which gave the power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Now, let me ask you something. You know, is the world wondering after any world leader right now? Is there any world leader? I mean, obviously people are wondering at Biden, but it's not because they think he's just a powerful leader. They're wondering like, how is this guy even the president? That's what they're wondering about. They look at Biden, they're just wondering like, how did this guy even get his driver's license you know how did this guy even survive to this point he can't even formulate a sentence you know the wonder that people have towards uh, towards biden is not the same wonder that people are going to have towards the antichrist the wonder that the world's going to have towards the antichrist is who is able to defeat this guy if he can't be killed if he dies and he's coming back to life he's been dead for three days and he comes back to life you know what they're going to say oh this must be what god this must be the Lord Jesus Christ because he died, was buried, he resurrected. This is the promise that people have been saying he is the savior, okay, this political leader. Because, you know, people are always looking for a political savior. The world's always looking for a political savior. Well, this guy's like the culmination of that, you know, that, that vision that people have of a political savior. But it says there that he continues 40 and two months, okay, which would indicate that essentially he's going to rule for three and a half years. Because 40 and two months is three and a half years, essentially marking the, 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 the completion of those seven years where Jesus Christ comes and he sets up his millennial reign. Okay. Now look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. He said, well, but you forgot to mention the abomination of desolation. Well, here's the thing is that when the Antichrist comes back to life, okay, and people are like, whoa, you know, this is the man he decides to set up an image, or he has, excuse me, a false prophet that makes an image of the Antichrist, and that the world should wonder, they should worship the beast through this image, this idolatrous, blasphemous image. 
Look what it says in verse number 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So when you think of a lamb, you don't really think of a false prophet, right? You think of a lamb, you think of Jesus Christ. You know, the lamb of God who should take away the sins of the world. The difference is, is that he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a devil. So this is referring to the false prophet who is testifying of the Antichrist, okay? So this guy comes on the scene. Look at verse 12. He says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So to kind of validate who he is, he's given this ability to actually call down fire from heaven. Now think about this. I mean, people will just believe anything nowadays, right? You tell them anything, they'll believe it. Our society is pretty dumb. They're willing to accept a whole lot of nonsense. Now think about when a guy actually calls down fire from heaven. That means the whole world will buy into whatever that guy says. If he's able to exercise the ability the supernatural ability to call down fire from heaven, I mean, that's a pretty crazy ability, miracle to do, wonder, it's going to cause men to believe him, okay? He says in verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this false prophet constructs this massive image of the Antichrist, and he tells everyone, worship this image. And anybody, Christians, who choose not to worship the image of the beast, is like, okay, not a problem, you just die. And then that's when martyrdom takes place. Now, this is what the Bible refers to as the abomination of desolation. This image that is set up for the Antichrist is referred to the abomination of desolation. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read to you from Matthew 24, verse 15. Jesus says this, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. What is he saying? Once you see this massive image cut, prop up that the, uh, that the false prophet sets up for the Antichrist, you know what he says to everyone? Run. Now it's time to run. Now it's time to flee because now they're going to be coming for your head. So how do we know that we're not currently in the tribulation right now? Well, I'm looking at this. There's no abomination of desolation out there. And none of us are running from the Antichrist right now. None of us are running from the image of the beast. There's no pope or false prophet out there that's telling you, worship this image. Now, there will be one day. There will be a false prophet, possibly the pope, possibly some charismatic leader, religious leader, who looks like a Christian, but speaks as a dragon, he speaks blasphemous things, and he's going to construct this large image for people to worship. Now let me ask you a question. When you're out there soul winning, when you're out there from day to day, has anybody asked you to worship an image of the beast that's about, I don't know, 10 stories high or so? I don't think anybody of us have. You know, we've seen it in the Bible, and obviously, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you know, they, they're trying to create these, these large statues. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but there's these large uh, uh, statues that can actually interact with people in different parts of the United States and even in the UK. And that's not the abomination of desolation, but in my personal opinion, they're doing that to kind of just prepare people to normalize when the, when the official abomination of desolation is set up, okay? But even then, it's not the abomination of desolation. So how do we know we're not in the tribulation? How do we know we're not near the, the second coming of Christ? I don't see an abomination of desolation, do you? I don't think so, okay? And by the way, this is where, when the abomination of des desolation is set up, this is when the Antichrist goes into the third temple, okay, in Jerusalem, 
And the Bible says that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, saying that he is God. So it's at this point that the Antichrist says, by the way, I'm not just like a political savior. I am God. That's what he's going to say. Okay. Now, obviously, there's a lot of weirdos out there that claim to be Jesus. You know, I've seen people in Mexico that they claim to be Jesus. And, you know, you got this guy in Russia or whatever claims to be Jesus. Just weird people out there these, in these cult compounds that claim to be the second coming of Christ. But no one takes those guys serious. You know, no one's flocking to their part of the world to worship them. The Bible indicates here that the entire world, every kindred, nation, and tongue will worship this beast. And when he proclaims himself to be God, guess what? No one's going to have a problem with it other than believers. Okay? And so this is proof that we are not uh, in the tribulation. Here's, the, here's another thing. You're, go back to Revelation chapter 6, if you would. Revelation chapter 6. The sermon is called, Why We're Not in the Tribulation. You know, stop watching the news. Stop listening to these conspiracy theories on YouTube or on social media. You know, read the Bible yourself. Talk to your pastor. Listen to biblical preaching. And don't allow yourself to be soon shaken in mind by letter, by spirit, or by word. Don't let people tell you, hey, this is happening right now. Because, you know, it instills fear in people who are just ignorant of the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, that stuff can scare you. If you don't know what the Word of God says about it, it can take you off guard. It can catch you off guard. It can cause you to think, man, what's going to happen? But once you know what the Bible says, once you know what the timeline is, when you hear something like that, it's like, well, that's dumb. We know that doesn't happen until X, Y, and Z takes place. I know God's going to take care of me. I know he's going to provide for me. I know that he's going to protect me. I know that he's going to be there for He'll never leave me nor forsake me. And I have the Bible to help me navigate through these difficult times. You know, we're not in the tribulation. I'm just experiencing a tribulation. Okay. Here's the next one is that the mark of the beast has not been instituted. Okay. Now, again. The vaccine is not the mark of the beast. A tattoo, not the mark of the beast. There's people out there that put 666 on their forehead, 666 on their hand. You know, it's pretty dumb for them to do that. Still not the mark of the beast. Okay. <clears throat> you say, well, how do you know those things are not the mark of the beast? Well, you know, there's a narrative that's being pushed, especially in regards to vaccines and all that, uh, being the mark of the beast. There's a narrative that will say, well, you know, don't take the vaccine because if you do, you're going to damn yourself to hell or something. Okay. Now, here's the thing is that I'm sure your pastor agrees with this. You know, we don't, we're not for vaccines, obviously. It's not wise to take it. It's detrimental to your body. But let's say for whatever reason you decide to take the vaccine, but you're saved. Guess what? You stay saved. You don't lose your salvation. Okay. I mean, it'll be like you drinking alcohol you're putting these toxins in your body but it doesn't mean you lose your salvation right it's like putting poison in your body but it does nothing to your soul fear not them which can kill the body but afterwards can do nothing but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell you know once we're saved our soul is in the hand of the father jesus said i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand that's what the bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of god so yeah you can destroy your body with with bad eating, with drugs and alcohol and vaccines, not recommending for you to do so. I'm just saying that people would do those things, but it doesn't do anything to their salvation, okay? But here's the thing is that people will say, well, this is the mark of the beast, and, you know, if you take this, you're not a good Christian because you're taking the mark of the beast, etc. Not true. Not true at all, okay? Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse number 5. Now, why is the mark of the beast instituted in the first place? Why does he want to institute that? Well, look at verse 5. It says, When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld a low black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See thou hurt not the uh, oil and the wine. Go back to Revelation 13 and go to verse 16. So in Revelation 6, we see that the black horse comes about and he represents famine, inflation, and guess what happens? 
no one is able to buy food, okay? So there's going to come a time when your credit card, your debit card, your cash will be no good. It's not going to be worth anything, okay? Because of this massive inflation that we're going to see in the end times. And so much inflation that it's going to cause famine. People are going to be dying of starvation. And you know what? People do some pretty extreme things when they're hungry. Like if they're hungry and they're starving, people will go to some great lengths to get some food. I mean, when you study the Word of God, I just I was just reading in 2 Kings how there was a famine and there were like women boiling their own children to eat them because they were starving. I mean, people do some pretty imagine, unimaginable things when they're in a state of starvation. Well, picture that worldwide, okay? So you have this famine taking place. People are dying. But then the Antichrist comes and says, you know what? I got the answer. We have to institute a new form of currency, a one world currency that we can all use to get everything back to normal, back on track. We can buy food. We can, you know, you can uh, use your money to, to purchase all the resources you need. We just kind of need to reset the economy once again, but we need, to use, we need to use this one world currency to do so, okay? And this is why the mark of the beast is even instituted. As far as from a political standpoint, it'll be essentially the, the, the saving element of this world. People are going to be like, oh, where's it at? Free money? Let's do it. And they're going to say this, you know, hey, it's nothing different than your Apple Pay. You know, I have Apple Pay. By the way, I like New World Order uh, technology. It's very convenient, and I'm saved, and I will never go to hell, so that's why I like it. Okay, I could just deet right there, and it doesn't affect me at all. But, you know, it, obviously it leads to all that stuff. But, you know, your phone, you could just, you don't even have to touch, especially now with the coronavirus, they're just like, oh, everything's like touchless, right? You can go like this. I can grab my watch and do this. I mean, they even have the technology now where they put the chip in your hand. Okay, it's called Amazon One, believe it or not. Okay, you know, like one world government, one world order, one world financial system. It's called Amazon One. You go to the grocery store, the Amazon grocery store, you get all your groceries and you go, deep, deep. you know, you just pay with your hand, just with the palm. Now, that's not the mark of the beast. That's the technology of the mark of the beast, but that's not the mark of the beast. You say, well, why are they doing that? Because they want to get the population accustomed to that technology. So when the, this mark of the beast comes out, they're like, oh yeah, we've been doing this for years. And you weird Christians out there said that Amazon One was the mark of the beast and nothing ever happened. Here I am with this, with this chip in my hand. I'm not in hell. I'm not a reprobate. I'm not worshiping the devil. Nothing ever happened. So just switch out this chip with this other chip from this guy who actually came back to life. And he's not like, you're Jesus. Your Jesus hasn't even come back. Our Jesus is right here. That's what they're going to say. And so he's going to institute this mark of the beast. Now, why is the Antichrist enforcing this mark of the beast? Why is he introducing this to the population? Is it because he cares for the starving Africans, ch African children in Africa? Is, he, does he, is it because he cares for any starving person around the world? No. The reason he institutes the mark of the beast is not to feed the world. Listen to this. He does it to find you. That's the main reason he he does it because a prerequisite to getting the mark of the beast is that you have to worship the beast. Well, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you can't worship the beast. It's impossible for any safe person to worship Satan, even if you're starving. Even if you're starving, you're just like, you know, you're, you're, you're just have no resources. You can never bring yourself to actually worship Satan. It's impossible for us to do because we have the spirit of God dwelling within us. That's why. But, you know, for the unbelievers out there or for the Christians who think that they're saved, but they're not because there's a lot of people like that, right? They claim they name the name of Christ, but they're not really saved. You know, to them, it's going to be easy. They're like, oh, this is God, though. And they'll take the mark of the beast. Now, in Revelation 13, it says that it's given unto the Antichrist to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So the reason why he wants to institute the mark of the beast is to filter out who the real Christians are. And that's going to be real easy for him to do because the way he's going to find them is 
who are the ones that can't take the mark? Bring me the people who cannot take the mark of the beast. And they're going to round up the Christians. They're going to round up the actual saved people, the believers of this world, and they're going to put them to death. That's what the Bible tells us. They're going to, he's going to seek to persecute. It's not because he's trying to feed the world after this cataclysmic, you know, chaotic time known as the beginning of sorrows where there's no food. He's using that as a springboard to introduce the mark of the beast so that he can kill you and your family and all Christians. That's what the Bible says. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about Satan being cast out of heaven. And it says that he comes to the earth and he says that he has but a short time. Therefore, he goes to make war with the seed of the woman, referring to us. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Has anybody seen a mark? Has anybody of you, first of all, taken any mark? Okay. And if you did, did you have to worship Satan in order to do so? First of all, none of you, I'm, I'm sure, have taken a mark or something. But let's just imagine for a second that you did. I guarantee you didn't have to worship Satan in order to get it. Well, that's the prerequisite to get this mark of the beast. So how do we know that we're not in the tribulation? I'll tell you why. The mark of the beast is not here. Amazon 1 is here. Tattoos are here. That technology exists. You have Elon Musk with his Neuralink where he could put a chip inside your head and you can listen to your favorite playlist or whatever, you know. But that's not the mark of the beast, Okay. This is how we know. And lastly, here's the last thing. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Here's my last point. And I'm done. My last point is this, is, and I mentioned it throughout the sermon. This is how we know we're not in the Great Tribulation. This is how we know we're not in the Tribulation period. Christians are not being martyred. Now, have there been Christians who have died throughout the world, throughout the years? Absolutely. I'm sure there's Christians in, in Korea and in China believers who have died, but we're talking about global persecution where Christians, even in the United States of America, will be put to death. Because when the Antichrist seeks to make war with the saints, it's not like, oh, I'm going to leave the American Christians alone. I'm just going to leave the American Christians alone. I'm going to go for the African Christians. I'm going to go for the Korean Christians. I'm going to go for the Russian Christians. I'm going to go for, you know, the South American Christians. He just wants to go after every Christian. Because to him, nation doesn't matter. It's the fact that they're a part of the nation of God. They're believers. They're children of God. That's why he wants to kill them. And so this is why we know we're not in the tribulation. Because if we were, you and I would be hiding right now, fleeing, you know, from the Antichrist. Because we're on, we're on the run from Satan himself because he's trying to kill us. Look at Revelation 6 and verse number 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them which dwell on the earth? So during this time, this is after the four horsemen of the apocalypse, after the wars and rumors of wars, the famines, pestilences, death on a massive scale, the abomination of desolation has been set up, the mark of the beast has been instituted, uh, the Antichrist proclaims himself to be God, then Christians start dying for their faith. This is how we know we're in the tribulation. Okay, Not because you stubbed your toe on your furniture, or whatever, or you're having a tough time, you're going through a difficult time. You know, we all go through tribulation. Jesus said, in this world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But folks, there's a far greater tribulation at hand that's going to come one day, but it's just not here as of yet. Now, what's the real message that I want to get to across to you? Well, obviously, I want to let you know that we're not in the tribulation. However, please listen to this, and I'm done, and then we'll... Go do the burgers, right? I'm just kidding. Here's the one thing that you need to know, okay? You should rest easy knowing we're not in the tribulation right now. But let me say this. You better be enduring the tribulations that you're going through today. Because if you don't endure the tribulations of today, you for sure won't endure this tribulation right here. So if there's one application you can get from this, it's this. You know, if all that information just bored you half to death, if the numbers didn't, didn't impress you at all, well, get this. May this teach you that you, be able to, you better be able to endure the hardships of this world and the hardships that you're experiencing today, the trials, the difficulties, 
the heartbreaks, the emotional pain and heartaches and tribulation that you're going through today because my friend, they are the precursor to the tribulation that we're gonna see in the Bible one day. And if, you ha if you're having a hard time being a Christian during times like this, when you're going through tribula personal tribulation, you're not gonna be able to survive this tribulation. You know, God gives us tests throughout our life. And the reason he tests us throughout our life is so we can pass the next test. He gives us hardships today so we can face the greater hardship tomorrow. He gives us a trial and a tribulation today to make us strong enough spiritually to face that tribulation tomorrow. You know, it's one thing to know what the Bible says about this tribulation. It's another thing not to know the tribulation you're going to face tomorrow, but being determined to endure it, knowing full well that another one is coming in the future. Okay? So my encouragement to you and Hold Fast Baptist Church is hold fast. Amen? Hold fast, be strong, unmovable. Make sure that you endure the temptations of this life. Don't let Satan, don't let persecution, don't let heartache, don't let trials, don't let tribulations ever stop you from coming to this church. Amen? Don't let them stop you from soul winning. Don't let them stop you from reading the Bible. Don't let them stop you from serving God. Don't let them stop you from praying because one day you're going to need that endurance in the future. It's not today but it will come one day. Let's pray.